They might be noticing they're starting to think they're having a reaction, for example. And I think, you know, as you've kind of described there, for some people, they might be feeling anxious. They might then start to get symptoms that feel a little bit like when they're having a reaction. And then what often happens is that... Could you do me a massive favour and click follow or subscribe button? It helps the podcast out so much. Karen, so you're the first ever kind of clinical psychologist to have on the podcast. And they had Dr. Adam Fox on the podcast at the beginning of the season. Do you work with him as well? Because he mentioned your name, actually. Yes, I do. So I've worked with um, Adam both in the NHS and privately, actually. So yeah, Adam is someone I know, know well professionally. Yeah. And I always find it quite interesting with the guests, like when they're growing up and kind of like their childhood. For me, there's like certain moments where I knew I was either going to get into like video content creation or even I'm a graphic designer by trade. So like from an early age, was there any kind of moments in your life which is you thought, you know what, this might be really what, what to do, which just kind of pushed you towards kind of psychology. Yeah, so actually, oh. originally I wanted to be a dancer when I was younger, um, and dislocated my knee. So I had to oh, start wow. thinking about kind of different different options, really. So I'd How say, old was you at that age then, when you disconnect? Gosh, um, it was in a PE lesson, about 12, I think I was. Yeah, so dance was always a passion, kind of growing up. So I'd say probably from the age of about 16, I would say, was when I thought, actually, I want to be a therapist. So it wasn't so much a clinical psychologist at that age. I don't think I really knew what clinical psychologist was. Um, but I would definitely say I wanted to be a therapist of, of some kind, actually. So I'd say from the, about the age of 16, I was, yeah, had that as an idea. Was it like an interesting like people's behavior and how kind of people work kind of thing they're, they're thinking? Yeah, so I started off actually doing sociology for GCSE. So more around groups, society, um, I found it so interesting. And actually I thought I'm really interested in individuals, kind of individual minds, individual behavior. Um, so that's kind of what led to it really. So just developing on from sociology and did... Uh, psychology a level which again I really enjoyed um and then went on from there really how, how many years did it take then to kind of study like psychology is it quite a few yeah it is quite a few so thinking back I did an undergraduate psychology degree that was four years with a placement year so I kind of went off worked in the field um for a year then I went on to do a master's in mental health at King's College London which mm-hmm. You don't have to do isn't a prerequisite of some courses but again I just wanted to continue that study so that was five years then I went on and worked for I'd say about three years an assistant psychologist I worked in um, like a forensic setting also worked with young people with eating disorders I did that for three years um, and then went on to do the doctorate which was three years so oh uh, probably about eight years of study and three years of experience um, to get to that point. But like I say, not all of that is necessary. Some people do an undergraduate degree, a little bit of experience and then are get you, onto the Are doctorate. you glad you did it then to get that experience in the, the kind of quite a few different fields then? Yeah, I really valued yeah. it. And I think for me, I wanted that experience of building therapeutic relationships, working with lots of different people just to get that, get that experience really. So yes, for me, I really, really enjoyed it actually those kind of assistant psychologist years building up those skills it I for me it really prepared me I think going on to the doctorate and time I really look back on fondly actually was there like certain areas where you was like no I could see myself doing this like in the future yeah so again you know I, when I was an assistant psychologist kind of working with clinical psychologists at I mean, that point area, yeah. yeah I was I was thinking actually yeah this is what I want to do for me I really enjoyed that you could draw on different models so learning from supervisors that wouldn't just work in one model with somebody but that could actually say here's my understanding of somebody and let me draw on lots of different models it was the aspect that really drew me whereas there's you know some particular trainings where you might only be trained in one model for example and that is great and you know cbt for example fantastic it has strong evidence base in lots of different areas But I've found that has fallen short a little bit in places when working with adults, parents, children with allergies. Um, So for me, I'm so grateful that I've got other models to draw on that can really help people kind of move forward with their lives. 
I was going to ask what with that link towards like food allergies. Mm. Like, do you do you have an allergy yourself, or have you got connections, or have you got a family member with a food allergy? No, I don't. So I don't have any allergies myself. I have got kind of family, like distant family members that um, are living with allergy. But actually, when I entered into this kind of world, it was new to me. I had um, worked in a pediatric setting for my last placement. Um, when I was training in the doctorate. So I was working with young people with various kind of um, medical conditions. And I just felt so passionate about it. I absolutely loved that placement. Our teaching, when I was on the doctorate, I think there was maybe only one or two sessions actually on supporting young people with medical conditions. It was very limited, but it really sparked my interest. I thought, I love, you know, I really, this is an area I really want to work in. I really want to support young people and families navigating that journey when they are living with a medical condition so I went on did that um that placement like I say really enjoyed it and then when I was doing that training that that placement that's when a job came up um in the NHS for the for the allergy role and I just went straight into that actually when I qualified and that's the role I've been doing since I qualified in 2018. There's actually not many people like yourself within that role which also specialize within allergies and kind of the psychology and the kind of mental implications of that why is that do you know why so it is it is really limited I think there is um obviously a select number of um kind of pediatric allergy clinics across across the country within that you know even then I think there's limited access to psychologists within that service so within the service that I work in the NHS I and place within the allergy service that is my I guess kind of full-time role in other services it might be that there is a psychologist within the hospital where they have only a certain amount of hours to support um, kind of young people that are living with allergies and um, so it is really limited and it, you know I'm really pleased that more research is going into that so um, Rebecca Nib, who is a psychologist that works at Aston University I think it is is kind of her and her team are really looking into this at the moment in terms of access to psychological therapies globally. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. So I think that's going to be really kind of interesting, you know, the kind of findings from that. And also, you know, I think a lot is going on about how we can increase access because at the moment it is so limited, you know, and I'm part of a special interest group with other psychologists. And like I say, even that is, is quite a small group, really, when we think about kind of other areas. Um, so the access is very limited and, the, and there isn't a lot of, um, I guess, choice for children, parents, adults is even less support, I would say, in terms of, you know, that specialist input. Again, I'm not aware of any psychologist working in adult services where there is a dedicated psychologist um there might be it'd be really great to kind of hear back on that but not somebody that I'm kind of aware of so it is really lacking I think again that comes down to funding the NHS you know um clinicians trying to build business cases to kind of show the importance of this but I think it's really important to recognize it is limited and you know there's only certain points and avenues that families can go to to kind of seek that support yeah because I think with the food having a food allergy as well I think that anxiety then kind of plays in probably other areas of your life as well and it all starts off you know, like I said if they're, if they're young as well and they've got anxiety because the food allergy then they're probably really going to have that affects kind of later on in life yes and like you say I think when I support young people you know for some I think it's important to say not every child family adult living with um, allergy might experience you know anxiety but my experience is for some young people when they are feeling anxious about aspects of their allergy other areas can be Imp like impacted because of course food comes up in so many yeah. areas so I think school particularly is an area that I support with quite a lot, um, you know, around trips, even just lunchtime snacks. So I do think for some young people, it can then start to impact quite widely. Yeah. I was going to ask as well, in regards to what does kind of a session kind of involve? Because I think it's just like, there's a bit of a hurdle sometimes <laughs> in there and there's a bit of anxiety. Like, oh God, what does it involve? Why is it going to work for me? And I mean, I imagine it, it, for me, um, CBT didn't work for me. Mm. I, I felt talking therapy was better can mm -hmm. you talk about what would a session involve if someone got in touch yeah of course so it always starts with an assessment well if I talk in the way that that I kind of work but I think that is quite typical so it'd start with an assessment session so 
For me, that's getting to know more about the person, what's led to therapy right now. So you're just getting a sense of those kind of factors. So for me, you know, if someone's getting in contact and they're saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with living alongside my allergy, you know, that's what I'm kind of seeking support with. I always say to them at the start, you know, I'm going to kind of talk about the allergy aspect, but I want to get to know you as a person, you know, because that's not just in isolation. It's important to build that therapeutic relationship. And actually research has shown that the therapeutic relationship is so key in outcome. So if you don't have that therapeutic relationship with somebody, you can teach them loads of strategies. But actually, if they're struggling to bring what's important to them. What do you mean by therapeutic? Them, so the relationship that you build kind of within within the um, therapy space. Oh, okay. So somebody coming along feeling kind of safe, contained, heard, all of those kind of aspects. Them feeling comfortable to really come to the session and you're somebody they're going to open up to. Yeah, Is that difficult now with obviously everybody doing it over like Zoom mm. and kind of like Teams. Is it, is it really hard then for them to maybe not open up as much potentially because it's online? Yeah, so I've yeah. worked mainly online since actually the start of the pandemic. Um, and there's no doubt about it. There, It's not for everybody. And that's also part of the assessment, how somebody engages, how they find it. So, you know, I think that is really important. I think for some people it is a barrier because they want to be in the room. They want to feel that connection to somebody. Yeah. You know, you're going along, you're opening up about the things that you're finding, you know, the most scariest things to talk about. You want to feel heard and that you can open up to that person. And I do think for some people, they need that in the room contact. But actually, I think we all adapted, didn't we, to that yeah. kind of online way of working. For me, I remember actually, I look back on the doctorate and they were talking about this telehealth idea and talking over certain platforms and I was like oh this isn't this isn't for me it's like, crazy yeah because <laughs> yeah. I, I used to have like an office job like now my job's like fully remote and it's yeah. been like that since lockdown I've moved jobs like two three times and the last job I was in the office maybe like one day a week but like this job like it's pretty much remote like we do go into the office like occasionally we've got like a WeWork, work but yeah it's just crazy I think it kind of transfers like for me as well I think like the mental health is better because I can go to the gym at lunch mm. and like I'm not stuck in an office and it's warm and it's like yeah I don't know yeah yeah and I yeah exactly and I think it was just a shift and I think for a lot of people you know you look you think of therapy and you think of kind of in the room which completely and I look back and I think actually my ideas have shifted but don't get me wrong I you know I love kind of seeing people in the room because actually you pick up on a lot when you have somebody in the room that you're just missing it's like signals and signals, their body, language, yeah. body language you know for younger children I work very much from a play perspective so drawings and um you know play and that's the part that's quite lacking obviously over over zoom or or teams or whatever it is um so I think you know it's worth thinking about that but also being able to work online has really opened up people's access to psychological therapy I see people up and down the country you know and of course it is a resource you know in terms of private therapy of course it's a it's a, a resource that you know not everybody has access to but for some people that can access that I think being able to access it remotely has really opened that up and I think you know I think that's quite important as well that there's different avenues for people to kind of access yeah because I, I originally did it um I went private the first time and then the second time but yeah the first time for me was just like talking therapy and for me I felt that was more kind of beneficial can and cbt mm. in regards to like the amount of kind of sessions you should have is he like a right number or because like sometimes i'm like i don't know like because obviously it's quite it could get quite expensive sometimes and, and it's just trying to work out how many sessions i need to actually kind of get to the bottom of the problem yeah yeah really really great question and always the question you know frequently comes up when people yeah. get in contact how many sessions am i going to need and i guess there's guidelines out there called nice guidelines for things like anxiety low mood that would recommend a particular amount of sessions the difficulty is with with um allergy in terms of psychology specifically there's just not the research like i say that is growing and we are building um the evidence base of the psychological i guess approaches that are helpful for working with allergy and cbt i think is the 
therapeutic approach I think is researched probably the most that is building again I know Chrissy Jones a psychologist based down in Surrey University actually is looking at kind of mindfulness and some other um, therapeutic approaches which I think is important because as you touched on CBT isn't for everybody and I think you know there are points where that can fall down and CBT is included within the kind of talking therapy I guess umbrella that would be kind of included um, if we t- if, if we touch upon like the differences between CBT yep. and kind of therapy, because I think some of the listeners not might not be aware of CBT and, and how it's different to kind of just talking therapy. Yeah, so CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy. So the main idea behind that is that our thoughts are connected to our behaviour, how we feel, and what happens in our body. So it says that all of those aspects are connected and influence each other. So the thing with CBT is it's quite, um, like others, strategy-based. So there might be strategies where you might um, kind of focus on your thinking and the thinking styles that you might um, have. So, you know, if a worry comes up, whether it's kind of catastrophizing, so thinking about the worst case scenario that might come up. So there can be a focus very much on what's happening in your mind and let's maybe think of alternatives. And I think there is this idea that you're going to switch it to, you know, a really positive thought or something that's going to happen, but actually it doesn't have to be that extreme. It's trying to broaden your perspective, think about kind of an alternative way to see a situation and whether what you're thinking about is a fact or opinion. So it's very kind of cognitive led. But there's another aspect to it, which is about, I guess, reducing avoidance. So if we think about um, restaurants, for example, which is an area, as we know, comes up a lot with living with allergies. And, you know, for some people uh, I support when I'm doing my assessment and checking out about restaurants, they'll say to me, actually, Karen, you know, a parent, we're not really a family that really ate out of restaurants that much anyway. So, you know, that's not really something that I want to kind of focus on. But for other families, they'll say, actually, we feel really kind of anxious about going to restaurants. We don't eat out at restaurants as a family. And actually, that's really impacting our quality of life. We'd like that to be different. I'd like that to be different. So in that environment, cognitive behavioral therapy can help because there's something called graded exposure. So the idea is that you reduce the avoidance, you take gradual steps to build your confidence with eating out. So cognitive behavioral therapy, like I say, it's very much about our kind of thinking processes, how that impacts our behavior and the kind of impact on our our body. I use that a little bit in my work, particularly the graded exposure work where I might be building somebody's confidence with restaurants. How, other- how would you build that confidence? Would it be taking small steps or just yeah. taking that step to kind of eat out in one place? Kind of thing? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So again, you know, this is why that assessment session that I was talking about earlier is so important because you really need to understand, you know, what is driving that avoidance? Because if I take another example that I find so helpful to talk about with graded exposure is a needle phobia. So I've had, um, you know, referrals or parents getting in contact to say, you know, I've taken my child along for their medical appointment, which again, you know, can be really challenging for some children and parents that are bringing their children along to support it as well. And they'll say, you know, or a clinician might say, you know, this child's becoming quite distressed when they are, you know, going for their... um, for their skin prick test, can you, I think they've got a needle phobia. Can you, can you support with that? Yeah. Um, which makes sense because you're going for your skin prick test and, you know, obviously they're using the Lancet. So, you know, the, um, kind of instrument used to kind of, um, I call it pop the bubbles on, on the arm. Um, and it makes sense. You might think you look at it, you think, oh, okay, they've got a needle phobia because they're getting quite distressed. But I can think of quite a few people that I've worked with that actually, when I've really sat down and spoken to the child, actually for some, it's not about the needle for some it is about a fear that putting an allergen on their arm is going to cause anaphylaxis and actually if you didn't have that assessment session where you're spending the time exploring that with a child you could go down a whole different treatment route of thinking okay needle phobia great I'm going to take these small steps to build their confidence but you're missing something because actually that's not what the the barrier is that's not the that's not what is driving the avoidance the distress 
with the um, procedure is actually a fear that they're going to cause anaphylaxis. And actually those two treatments look very different. You know, it's about bringing a nurse on board, very much kind of, you know, working collaboratively with with colleagues. And I guess for me, that's, you know, my passion. That is the the bit I love about my NHS role is that you can bring, you know, other professionals involved and I'll work closely with the nursing team and say, OK, can you come join me for this psychology session? And, you know, the young person, the child can ask you questions about it. And actually for some young people, just giving them that knowledge, just giving them that opportunity to express how they're feeling and to say gosh actually it's really understandable that you get distressed when or sad worried whatever the word is they use of course when you come in for your skin prick test because you're really worried that you're going to have anaphylaxis that makes sense some children giving them that knowledge giving them that time to sit down and say I hear you I can see that you feel really nervous about this we are all here to support you can be enough that they might not need six sessions, eight sessions, yeah. whatever it might be. Um, Finding the right kind of psychologist as well. And the one you feel like say the most relaxed around, because imagine there's, there's obviously analogies, <laughs> not as many, but say in general, like it's just finding that one where you can feel like you can be yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think that is really key. And, you know, if we think about and I guess it might be helpful for, for people to be aware of, I guess, what are the options? What are the options available? If you're struggling or your or your child is finding it difficult, this this journey of living alongside allergy, what are the options? I guess as we've touched on, some allergy clinics have a psychology embedded, a psychologist embedded within them. Fantastic. You know, if that's if that's a service that you have access to, it's about speaking to your allergy consultant or your or the nurse and saying, you know, we're finding this difficult. My yeah, child's I think they're doing it difficult. in like group sessions, like Dr. Adam Fox, because just, there's just not enough and like the funding and everything. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And we were running group yeah. sessions, which was fantastic. And then the pandemic hit and we moved remote, which worked again, OK for, for children, but had its limitations because, again, they were just getting used to that. Whereas children I see now on on Zoom, some children are, are used to it. They feel comfortable with that. But at that stage, when we moved, it was new to everybody. Like I say, I when I learned about it in um, about working remotely during the the doctorate, I was like, oh, that is not for me. Like, what, yeah. what's that? Like, <laughs> I'm not doing therapy world, yeah. over over a computer. But yeah. we've we've shifted our mindset. Our mindset has shifted, yeah. and you know, I think groups were fantastic. Again, we just couldn't run groups for young children on zoom it just wouldn't have worked practically but parents we did can continue to run the workshops and the workshops are fantastic because you can cover material that you hope is going to be helpful you talk about strategies we kind of you know have that and we've run parent workshops before where we would have a nurse or one of the great consultants kind of join us and actually what a resource, you know, parents seem to have really enjoyed that. So they get the kind of medical information that they might have wanted and they get the, you know, psychology input. But I found whatever topic we ran it on and we might cover transitions. So moving from, you know, moving into nursery, moving into secondary school, again, areas that I support with a lot because I think that brings up quite a lot for parents and young people yeah. doing those kind of transitions. But parents all, all would always feed back. Actually, it was it was really lovely to hear other people's experience. And that would be just, that would be the majority of the feedback. So actually providing that space where parents could get the information, but it felt like almost more importantly, sit in a room with people that they thought actually, people, people get it. it. They understand yeah, yeah, yeah. it. And, you know, that can feel really powerful because again, I often speak with people and, they just feel like family don't particularly get it or or friends and actually i think you know again it'd be the same feedback for teenagers yeah you know, absolutely no because i get it on instagram like someone will message and be like oh oh my god like i thought i was the only one or yeah. i've listened to a podcast or i've come across your instagram channel and yeah it's really nice that they now don't feel alone and now they're part of this community and then either whether it's through my page or someone else's page to kind of come across all the different kind of allergy bloggers, which is great. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's so lovely about the allergy community in terms of the um, activity on Instagram. I think in particular, it's so lovely that, 
you know, everybody seems quite really supportive of each other and kind of sharing stories and, you know, growing as a community. I think it's incredible to kind of see. And it's lovely from a professional kind of point of view to kind of be a part of that and hopefully bringing something that's kind of useful for families that don't have access to it. Like I say, you know, there's the the kind of embedded option. Other than that, you could, of course, seek kind of a referral for your GP through like an improving access to psychological therapies. So that is a more of a general service. So you might not find somebody, it's unlikely that you'll find somebody that's got allergy specific kind of expertise, but there might be. Um, but again, that is an option from the NHS kind of perspective. I really wanted to ask, obviously, what tools would you give to parents to kind of make their children feel more empowered about their allergy? It's something I've got a lot as well on DMs. I'm like, no, I'm not a doctor or a psychologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, and there's even times where I had to send them my, the kids like voice notes to just be like, you know what, you've got an allergy, but I still go on holiday or I still yeah. go out and that kind of thing. What what kind of tools or resources would you say to parents? Yeah, re- yeah, great question. And for me, you know, I, I talk a lot about starting these conversations early. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to keep it developmentally appropriate and you know if questions come up it's really important to be kind of honest with those but I often say start these conversations early make it that all of the all of these conversations are part of everyday life like I say important to be aware of your child's age and their understanding and I think that's key because it's kind of building their awareness their knowledge and that in itself can feel empowering if we think about what that's like for adults you know and I often say to parents you know utilize kind of um anaphylaxis uk allergy uk give yourself that information because you know it's important that you feel empowered as a parent in order to be able to kind of share that because i think if they're they're quite anxious as well i've always felt like that could like rub off Mm. onto the child potentially Mm. i obviously i'm not a psychologist but just from my personal experience like um i don't know my parents have always been like quite empowering or they never really even though I knew it was serious, like they didn't like scare me or mm. I still went to kids parties, but they made sure I had a packed lunch. And even now I like, um, recently went to like, like a party and my mum, like a family party and my mum's like, well, bring you some sandwiches. Um, mm. I spoke to the catering team and they, and they was great as well. But yeah. like for me, it's just like still being able to kind of be involved and not feeling left out. Yeah. And I think the really important thing to say, and you know, sometimes again, I, I people will come to me and they'll say, you know, I'm feeling really anxious. I just don't want to feel anxious anymore. And I think it's really important to start by saying anxiety is completely natural. It's completely normal. We all get it. And, you know, the aim I often say is to make things feel more manageable so that when anxiety arises, which it's, you know, like I say, completely natural, it's there to keep us safe. It's got this kind of evolutionary kind of element to it that when we perceive danger, we kind of go into this kind of system. So I think it is really important to start with that. And I think it's so important to say to parents, you know, it's understandable that these situations, you know, might make you feel anxious when you're thinking about your child going off to nursery, when actually you have been the one managing that, when you've kind of put all of these things into place and you've kept them safe and then you're handing that responsibility over to somebody else and you're effectively putting your kind of trust into them it's understandable that for some people that's going to make them feel anxious. And I think I often speak to parents about, again, it's not stopping them from feeling anxious. It's, you know, for themselves, it's about building and strengthening their ability to recognize when they are feeling potentially anxious and saying, okay, what, what is this about? And kind of exploring it for themselves and thinking, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to put in place to kind of help with this? So whether it's a kind of mindfulness exercise or you know whether there's actually quite a practical thing whether there is a trip coming up for example and they're starting to feel quite anxious about that there's some practical things that they might be able to put in place that's going to kind of help with that anxiety so I often say to parents it's not about you stopping feeling anxious or or sad or whatever the emotions are but it's about recognizing them building your ability and and kind of the skills to manage that And, you know, then supporting your child when those feelings come up, kind of modeling actually, you know, feeling sad or anxious and and the skills that you have and actually being able to show your child that, you know, this is how you kind of deal. It's okay to feel sad and anxious, but like, let's think about ways to kind of help with that. Yeah, because when when I eat out, I always like have this like massive red rash on my neck, Mm. like all the time. And it's like, 
it's just like a bit of like a heat rash and that but then it gets me like really worked up where I go to the mirror I'm like constantly like pulling my t-shirt net line to see if there's any hives and like there's never any hives it's yeah. just and it's just like in that situation what what would you recommend to try and stay calm and not get that that anxious build up kind yeah of yeah so again in terms of I guess there's some strategies and I um I guess I change the kind of focus depending on the age but I guess when it's an adult I would be thinking about you know kind of box breathing or a visualization or you know a grounding exercise so sometimes what, what can happen for some people is they might be kind of feeling anxious they might be noticing they're starting to think they're having a reaction for example and I think you know as you've kind of described there for some people they might be feeling anxious they might then start to get symptoms that feel a little bit like when they're having a reaction and then what often happens is that drives the thoughts of I think I'm having a reaction so if you think about it from a, a CBT perspective you can see in those situations how the thoughts are very much driving the kind of anxiety and kind of the bodily symptoms so it's about trying to from a CBT perspective break that cycle and have strategies that are going to m help to manage that anxiety. So like I say, a breathing exercise um, or a mindfulness exercise, trying to stay kind of grounded. So for some people, like a five senses where you work through each of the kind of senses can be quite helpful. But I think, again, it very much depends on what symptoms you're experiencing. So if for some people, they might notice a change in their breathing, for example. And, you know, for, for me, when I do an assessment, that's what I'm picking up on because if somebody, when they're feeling anxious, if they're worrying, they're having a reaction, if they notice a change in their breathing, I'm probably not going to introduce a breathing exercise. I'm probably going to do something else because again, I, I would kind of want to be shifting their focus kind of outward. Yeah. So when you have that worry, you're very much focused on your kind of so, internal yeah. states, aren't you? So I'd be saying, okay, let's maybe try and get some of that out. But it, that's why the assessment kind of process is, is key as working for a yeah, clinical I just want to say it's a moment to talk to you about a brand called Good. It's going free and it's just come available in Asda. It's a brand new brand. It's free from peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg and sesame. And they do kind of milk kits and wraps. So they do like fajita kits or they do hoisin. They also do katsu curry, which I've never had before. So yeah, it's great to try like different cuisines. When you've got lots of different allergies, it can be really difficult. And a lot of like supermarket brands now have that kind of make and same warning, which is really difficult for my allergies. So yeah. It's great as I've got it's gluten free sponsoring the podcast. If you want to find out more about them, I'll leave a link in the description below. They're also available to buy it as, as well. Let's jump straight back to the podcast. You kind of touched upon obviously CBT, but is there any other kind of therapy approaches you would recommend to kind of patients who reach out to yourself? Yeah. So another approach I, I've been working quite a lot with recently, actually, like I say, most of the research is around um, CBT. But like I've said, I, I have found that in some areas, CBT has fallen a bit short. You know, I might be working with someone and they might say, OK, you know, I've, I've, I've done this thought challenging where I've widened up my perspective. I tell myself that I've got my, you know, um, adrenaline device. I've got my medication, all of that. But actually, I don't feel any different you know, and it's actually not helping me to kind of make those steps. So an approach that I've been working with that I've found really helpful, which there is kind of a lot of research evidence to work with kind of physical health conditions generally, is something called a set acceptance and commitment therapy, um, which not a lot of people kind of know about. And it is an extension of CBT. But the difference with acceptance and commitment therapy is it's less interested in what the actual thoughts are. So with CBT, you're very much breaking down with somebody. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Let's list them. What kind of thinking patterns are they? But actually, ACT isn't as interested in that. And the idea behind ACT is to build kind of psychological kind of flexibility, kind of how we see a situation. And the idea behind it is we kind of get hooked into our thoughts. So these anxious thoughts might be coming up and they are we're getting hooked in, hooked in by them. So an approach is learning skills, I guess, to unhook. So a way that I often um, kind of describe it to people is, I guess, using this exercise to start. So I say to people, if you were to imagine your kind of anxiety, the, the thoughts that are coming up, for example, it sounds like they're very much kind of here, like right in front of your face. And they're coming up regularly, which for a lot of people living with allergy that are kind of accessing therapy, it is regularly because like we say, food is so central to our 
to our lives and they might be kind of being triggered quite you know often throughout the day so I'll say you know your anxious thoughts are very much in front of you and it, and it's you know what can you see kind of behind your hands and I'll often say well nothing you know these anxious thoughts are just here and I'll say okay and what does it feel like to maybe kind of you know be kind of pushing them kind of back and thought forth and they'll say that feels really tiring which again is kind of saying when we try to kind of fight against these feelings and try to push them down try to kind of counter them actually that can feel exhausting and I, I say to people that actually how would it feel just to have your hands just on your lap what does that feel like so the your hands are symbolizing the anxious thoughts and they're on your lap what does that feel like and I'll say to people yeah like I can feels a bit different and I'll ask them some questions and they'll say look I can kind of see what I'll say tell me what's in front of you and they'll be able to kind of see and the reason I use that is to say actually you know for some people these anxious thoughts are very much in front of them and and making it difficult to see what's beyond but hopefully what's kind of evident for explaining that is the idea isn't to get you know to kind of get them to go away they're still there they're still on our lap but what they you know, what we want to do is teach strategies that then can help us to do that, that can help us just to lower those thoughts and think about kind of what else is out there. So a lot of that work is about kind of grounding, staying in the present moment, because I, you know, I don't know what your experience is like, but, you know, a lot of things when they come up in terms of worries can be kind of maybe ruminating about the past in terms of, you know, things that have happened, you know, did I do this? Did I do that? Yeah, you know, whatever yeah, it might be, it, yeah. overthink it or thinking about situations that are coming up. So there's often a lot of hypothetical kind of situations and, you know, it is about kind of teaching strategies, strengthening strategies to kind of stay more in the present moment. Um, so kind of, yeah, those mindfulness um, kind of exercises, for example. The other really nice bit about that approach is that it also thinks about our values. So values is more of a kind of a direction that we're heading in. So it's not something that we can kind of tick off. It's more, you know, if we think about um, kind of what partner we want to be, what kind of parent we want to be, thinking about those general principles. So it can be really nice to kind of explore that with allergy parents. I think I use it more with parents than I do young people, okay. this element of the work. But it's about thinking, OK, you know, what? yeah kind of parent do you want to be what do you want in terms of socially and then thinking about their goals because often it's completely understandable when you've got a child living with food allergies or even as an adult living with food allergies that can take up a lot of time yeah. you know there's a lot of resource that kind of goes into that and for some people accessing therapy some parents they'll say actually yeah this is taking a lot of time and you know they want to balance that with also being able to maybe, you know, do some exercise, kind of build up their resources. And I guess it's about supporting parents to a place where they feel they can do both. And I feel there's so much balance, isn't there, between yeah. living with allergy. And we've spoken about this. How do you balance a kind of supporting your child with educating them with allergy without it kind of scaring them? How, oh, yeah. yeah, how do you balance keeping your child safe with actually making some time for you outside of that and that can feel challenging for some parents like I say it's not relevant for everybody and that's why that assessment session is so key because understanding what how is this person living with with alongside the allergies and what is it that they would like to feel a little bit different and I think it is about getting that understanding from families, from the young person. It takes a lot young, uh, longer with, with children. I spend a lot more time building that therapeutic relationship because if I had a young person, a child come to me and, you know, if I went straight in with what I call the problem talk and I was like, okay, tell me about your allergies and what you're finding hard. Yeah that's going to be a hard thing. Like they don't know me. They're like, who is this? Who is this lady that's yeah. just asking me about this thing? So I, I actually don't talk about the allergy for at least, you know, quite a bit into that assessment session. I say, look, I just want to get to know you. And it's not hiding it. You know, at the beginning of the session, I will say, you know, I'm somebody that supports young, young people and families living a song, living alongside allergy and when they might be th finding things hard. So, you know, it's important that they are aware of who I am and they're, yeah. they're, they're kind of aware of that. But once I feel they have that understanding, it is about building that therapeutic relationship. And I often say to parents, you know, for, for me, kind of as, as the kind of professional, what I'm hoping for is, of course, to get to know them. But 
I I like young people to leave thinking, okay, she was she was okay to talk to. I could I could go back and talk to her. And I, I found over the years, both when I've been training and as I've been qualified, I think if you don't make that time, you lose people. Mm. Because if you go, you know, and everyone will be different, don't get me wrong. If if a parent or a young person comes and they start with that straight away, it's about being responsive. It's about yeah. saying, okay, I'll go with it. But if you notice that a child is feeling quite anxious, I think it is about starting with the getting to know them first. Um, so yeah, act is, act is an approach that I think is really helpful and kind of mindfulness is kind of built inside that. And then kind of compassion focused therapy is another approach that I really like to kind of draw on. Um, and that is about kind of, building a more compassionate self kind of you know really bringing online our soothing system and you know it, I use that a lot with maybe parents again in particular that might be there might be some blame there might be some guilt um so those kind of difficult feelings that come come up I think particularly as a parent um so I think it's important for people to be aware there are various kind of therapeutic approaches and if you are seeking out a therapist you know they might not be trained in all of those areas. Um, it depends on yeah, what kind of therapist they are. It's a little bit overwhelming, can it? Sometimes, yeah. like, where do they take that first step? I really wanted to touch upon bullying and mm. algae bullying in particular. The Algae UK did a report recently, a few years ago now, actually. 40% of parents have kind of reported that kids now are getting harassed or bored because of food algae. Is that something you've kind of experience within your practice yes definitely and you know yes young people coming along and saying again it, it can take time to get to this point because of course it's this really difficult thing to talk about but I am finding yeah young people that I'm supporting will will bring this or you know parents will say to me we think that their young their, their child is being bullied um I think particularly with the kind of use of um kind of social media um I think that is kind of increasing and I often say to parents you know okay when they're asking me how, how can we can support that and I think it is about supporting children if it's not happening at the moment supporting children with recognizing bullying not only for themselves but if they notice somebody else being bullied you know what how can you support them with that you know going to a kind of trusted adult with that but I think again as a parent if your child is talking to you about being bullied you know, something I often say is about it can be really difficult sometimes, can't it? Because as a parent, we want to fix, we want to give kind of the solution, and that makes sense, you know, particularly when our child is having a difficulty. But also allowing the child the space to feel heard. And something I often talk about is that kind of acknowledge, validate, connect, connect kind of yeah, aspect. I saw that in Instagram, yeah. yeah, and you know, that's a really helpful thing just for adults, for children, but also for adults and kind of, you know, acknowledging with a child kind of how they're feeling ab about that and, you know, then validating it, you know, and being able to say, you know, I can see, you know, you feel really upset by that and that's understandable, you know, and kind of connecting with them is about kind of sitting alongside them with that and thinking about possible next steps. I guess with with something like bullying, you know, there does need to be some practical steps that are taken taken with that. I feel like it's becoming more often now. I spoke to Sarah Knight on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it was last year now, and she was saying, like, her boy, I think it was around, might have been Halloween, but, like, mm. obviously kids, like, teasing. And obviously before that, he never really kind of experienced, obviously, that. And then obviously when kids kind of you know what kids are like they can say nasty things and not really know the consequences of it yeah yeah and I think like I say it's about I guess how can we support the child yeah. and like I say acknowledging validating their experience I guess validating what, what does that mean it is about kind of a child feeling heard that you can kind of sit alongside them and say you know I see you're feeling whatever it might be kind of sad angry about that and perhaps again, kind of supporting them, maybe not obviously at that time, like I said, I think allowing that emotional expression is important, but at some point thinking, okay, would it be helpful for me to kind of go through with them, how you might respond to bullies, um, you know, and, and where you go to with that. And I think giving them some skills in, in that situation, of course, that will look different to different kind of children but kind of you know how do you say kind of no to something um and kind of and hold and hold that but also I think schools are so important with this um and I think the school kind of support intervention you know every school will have a kind of behavioral management type policy on how that will be dealt with so I think as a parent you know building that relationship with school going to them and saying you know these are these are your these are your concerns and 
Of course, it's not going to stop it. But this is why I feel so passionate about awareness within schools. And I know, um, I think it's Anaphylaxis UK have kind of um, like resources about um, like presentations and how you might talk about it within kind of um, your school environment. And of course, if you've if that hasn't happened and you've got a child that your child's being bullied, it's about supporting that child. But, you know, and building those skills. But I also think we need this growing awareness about allergies within school and it being a whole school approach so that children can feel supported, parents can feel kind of supportive of that. And I know there's this um, the um, policy around kind of managing allergies in school, which a lot of the kind of um, allergy charities kind of came to, together with to kind of produce. And I think it's really, really important to think, how do we, how do we move forward with this? And I think there is more awareness around allergies kind of generally, I think the psychological an- aspect is getting better, but I think still needs to grow. I really want to ask in regards to kind of like social media and kind of the implications of that. Um, I know that we see a lot of kind of allergy deaths, but I've had like two doctors on the podcast and they say like, it's actually quite unlikely for someone to have a fatal kind of anaphylaxis, but obviously people see it all the time in the news now. Yeah, Have you kind of noticed that kind of anxiousness with like families which kind of see this in the news um with your patients yeah and I think this is a theme that's kind of come up throughout my work but I would say you know the start of this year has been particularly challenging with with the deaths that have sadly sadly occurred and like you say as the consultants have touched on it's very rare but I think you know as as we know with social media it's kind of it has featured really heavily and it's really difficult isn't it because we want allergy awareness to kind of grow but when we see that those stories it it can be triggering for for some families for some for some children and it can be really difficult because I think then we are reading for some families they might be reading lots of articles and I think it is then increasing their anxiety so for some for some young people parents they might read that one article and of course it brings up difficult feelings for some they might read that and then it drives them to seek kind of more you know more information articles, seeking yeah. more I shared articles some on my instagram story there's an allergy death in the u.s and yeah. i was like thoughts go out to the family yeah. and like it was a tragedy but yeah. then by posting that someone messaged me and was like oh like because i've seen that now i like, you've gave me anxiety but i wasn't the first and the only person to share it and it's it's really yeah trying to find that balance because i want to empower people yeah. and bring content which brings value but also like I felt like I wanted to share it and yeah. it's, it's a really tricky, yeah. tricky ground to kind yeah. of, and like, it, yeah. Yeah. And like you say, it comes back to this balance. Yeah. There's so much balance, isn't there within, within allergies, living with allergies. And like I say, of course we want to grow our understanding. And like you say, send kind of condolences, our thoughts, a, a, you know, to families in such a difficult, difficult time. And for some people that is going to be, you know, for, for a lot of people reading these articles, it's going to be really difficult, um, you know, bring up lots of dif- difficult kind of emotions. And like I say, for some, it might lead to this kind of spiral where they're seeking information, but actually they don't, I rarely have I met with somebody that they've got to a point where they do feel, okay, my, my anxiety is relieved a little bit with reading all of this information and it might seem like a really obvious thing to say but I often say you know we need to we need to cut down on how much we're reading it I did the same because when yeah. I set up make and saying like for some reason it was you just go on news and type in allergies yeah thinking oh like something might spur an idea or how to yeah. pick content and um it just yeah it gave me anxiety at the start where I had like six months off like I still do it now sometimes because it's a bit overwhelming you know like yeah. talk about allergies all the time it's always at the top of my head or like what I don't know what guests are podcasts are yeah content and it just gets to a point where like sometimes just have a few months away just to kind of reset because yeah. if it's constantly on top of your mind you're constantly going to be more anxious so, yeah. of course and it's something that you know allergy families individuals are living with all of the time and by reading this again it kind of brings it to the forefront in terms of what some families are kind of managing you know why they do everything they do to protect themselves to protect their their child from from a reaction i think it just brings that kind of to the fore forefront it's again completely understandable that that will bring up a range of emotions for people and I often say it is about, you know, how do we then support that? And of course, that is going to be an avoidance, which as a psychologist, I'm kind of normally working kind of against, but, you know, in terms of to build someone's confidence and reduce the avoidance. But I think when it comes to news articles, I often say, actually, 
it is about kind of reducing our access to that and that's not just with allergies that's about kind of you know lots of lots of different areas if we're finding that's bringing it up I think actually you know if you see it then of course you know some people might want to find out a little bit more information I think like I say for some it can go quite far um so I often say you know it might be about initially cutting it down but if you're someone that is experiencing those difficult feelings I think it is about initially cutting down your access to it and then, you know, accessing even a like a general kind of resource like Calm or something where you can do some ask, breathing like, yeah, exercises. What kind of resource would you recommend for someone who potentially might not be able to afford therapy yeah. at this time? What would you recommend? Yeah. So again, I would use those, like I say, they're not going to be allergy specific, but still helpful to have kind of breathing exercises like mindfulness um, kind of um, resources to use, like the grounding things. I think, you know, you can definitely kind of draw, draw on those because, you know, they're going to be helpful just to soothe that system that comes online. So when we experience kind of anxiety and that fight, flight, freeze system comes online, what we want to do is kind of soothe that system. And something like a breathing exercise can be really helpful, like a mindfulness where we are shifting our focus to um away from maybe those anxious kind of thoughts and yeah i think that could be kind of helpful in those no situations but even just limiting our access to it is is a helpful kind of first step so it's just taking them kind of small steps to just kind of clear the mind but yeah <clears throat> it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast dr Karen murphy yeah have you enjoyed it i have <laughs> yeah. i have thank this you is your so first much podcast. it is my first podcast oh, amazing, yeah. yes it is so thank you so much for for having me and like I said of course it is a um you know it's important that people access resources when when they need to um but I think my override overriding message is anxiety is kind of understandable in the in these situations and if anyone wants to kind of get in touch or for your kind of social medias could you share that yep um so instagram at dr karen murphy although i don't post super regularly but hopefully that will grow um and yeah my website is uh dr karen murphy.co.uk oh it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast and oh. i'm sure it'll bring a lot of value so yeah thank you